This morning, we're going to continue with our, our series that we've been on. It's called The Gift of a Sign. If you haven't been here in recent weeks, maybe do a little bit of homework. You can go to familyfellowship.net and look at what, or just click watch. It's worth going back and watching them. They, God is just speaking some really good things to us um, with this theme of the gift of a sign. And so we're going to begin today the same way that I did last week. And I, I, I began our service by asking some questions. And so last week, you had the chance to be heads up about this week. And so if you didn't write down the questions that I gave you last week, then your answers this week are probably going to be the same as last week. Here's the questions that I opened us up with last week. How well have you been paying attention this last week to the God moments? Do y'all remember, the, remember some of these? The God moments, the, the peace moments. The moments of goodness, the moments of laughter. When did you laugh this past week? Good laughter, not at somebody or at the expense of somebody, but good, pure, whole laughter. When did you feel fully alive this past week? And I have to do this because we talked about this last Sunday. How many of y'all rested? Oh, Well, good. I see some hands and I hear a, yeah, I did. I rested. All of those that I just listed for us are moments in our week where God is showing up and saying, hey, I'm I'm, I'm in these moments. I'm in this moment. I'm with you. You're laughing now? That's a gift from me. That's, if we want to, without getting weird or anything, that's a sign from him that he is near us. The God moments, the peace moments, any goodness. Can I just say that this time of the year is my favorite and also most challenging because of the amount of people in this church that can bake. (laughs) So I saw all kinds of goodness last week. And I'm wearing bigger shirts because of it. Where did you laugh? Where did you feel fully alive? This week, or this day, what we're going to talk about, it's a different title than what I've done in the past. I had actually thesaurus this word, but great light and variegated victory. If I could revise it a little bit, I would add the word nevertheless in front of great light. Nevertheless, great light and variegated victory. Why did I use the word variegated? Because I was trying to find a word that, that explains and captures just all of the different layers and, and angles and, and substance to the victories that God gives us in our life. And so it's variegated. It's varied. There's a, there's a lot of substance and context to it. They're not just wimpy victories, but they are victories full of meaning. And so that's why we're going with great light and variegated victories. I've never said that word prior to this message, and so uh, there you go. Always learning. Let me do this. I, um, I feel the need to, to pray. I know we just did, but I have to like calm myself because I'm so excited about what God's going to speak to us in our gathering. So join me in this prayer before we get started. Father, right now, we invite the wisdom and the nearness of of the Holy Spirit. We invite you to speak to our heart, transform our mind, renew it actually so that we can be transformed. I pray that truth would land in here just like these big, uh, just bombs in our heart, just these big truths. For even the most hardened heart in here, I pray that you would soften it so that we can all walk out of here having encountered the one true God and being transformed into the likeness of Jesus. So Father, these words, these verses that we're going to go through, man, they're just so loaded with truth. And I pray that, I pray that we would have our ears on. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to go back to Isaiah. If you want to go ahead and start turning there, eventually we're going to make our way to Isaiah chapter 9. And I, I want to 
level the playing ground here and get us on, on common understanding about, about prophetic words, especially when we look at the prophetic or the prophets in Scripture. They were responding to uh, very real realities in their life when they were alive, obviously. And so they're speaking these words over um, particularly the children of Israel. And so as, as Isaiah and Jeremiah and some of the other prophets, as they're speaking, they are responding and, and forecasting the very near future for the children of Israel. Simultaneously, what they speak kind of sets this wake of, of, of um, words to be fulfilled. And so Isaiah is addressing the here and now in his life, but then there's so much of what he says and what he writes that Jesus was a fulfillment of. And so there's dual lanes that these words, these prophetic words are operating on. And so we have to keep that in mind as we go through these verses. Now, to build the full context of the verses that we're going to go through, I'm going to need some help from, from individuals this morning. One of these don't work, and somebody's going to figure out which one it is. But does anybody like to color? None of you want to color. All right, Celeste, Nikki, come on up here. I just need some colorers. And Aubrey, you can come on up here. Um, and, and this is what, what I want to do. Any other takers? I have three more. Come on, if you want to color, come on down. Any, any gents want to color? Yeah, Josiah, he, he, he did first service, and so he can do it again. All right, go on up there and start coloring. What I want to do is, is completely fill the whiteboard with marker. It doesn't need a, no pictures, just a whole, I just want you to color it in, as if the square of the whiteboard are the lines that are within your boundaries, and you have to color within those lines. All right, so just color as much of it as you can. Yeah, it doesn't need to look pretty, but just have at it while I'm talking. And so if you get bored with me, just watch how great they're coloring, all right? So it's multi-purposed. There's, there's something that we're going to read today that needs a deeper context, and so I'm going to rewind us a little bit and go into Isaiah chapter 8. Now, Isaiah, where we started with Isaiah a couple weeks ago, is um, he was responding to King Ahaz. If you recall King Ahaz, his final days were about eliminating access to the tabernacle. We don't want to go in the presence of God. We don't want to rest in the presence of God. And that's what he was making the last part of his life about. That's what he's known for, is just completely devaluing and defacing God. And so we're still on that vein of, of Isaiah is still, Ahaz is still alive, Isaiah is still speaking these things, and there's a section that we're going to read to kind of set up Isaiah 9 so that we have the full scope of these scriptures. And I'll let you guys know when you've done enough um, eventually, but you guys keep going for it. Isaiah chapter 8 verse 11 is where I'm going to start, and we're going to pick this apart. All right? Are you all ready? It's going to be good today. I'm just letting you know. So if you normally take naps in church, don't do it today. <laughs> For this is what the Lord said to me with great power, to keep me from going the way of this people. This is Isaiah speaking. Now we go into what God spoke to him with great power. Do not call everything an alliance that these people call an alliance. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be terrified. You are to regard only the Lord of hosts as holy. Only He should be feared. Only He should be held in awe. He will be a sanctuary. But for the two houses of Israel, He will be a stone to stumble over and a rock to trip over and a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. With me, or many will stumble over these. They will fall and be broken. They will be snared and captured. And so this is what you're to do. Bind up the testimony. Seal up the instruction among my disciples. I will wait for the Lord. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. I will wait for him. Now here I am with my children. The Lord has given me to be signs and wonders. If you recall, Isaiah named his children intentionally and 
the names that God gave him as a, as a prophetic sign to the people. You remember the, a remnant will return? You remember that name? And there's another name that's really long that I can't pronounce very well. Um, the children that the Lord has given me to be signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. When they say to you, consult the spirits of the dead and the spiritists who chirp and mutter, shouldn't a people consult their God? Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? Go to the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, there will be no dawn for them. He's saying, hold on to the word of God. And for those who don't do that, there's going to be only darkness. We're going to come back to that. Those people wander through the land, dejected and hungry. When they are famished, they will become enraged, and looking toward heaven, or looking up, they will curse their king and their God. They will look toward the earth and see only distress, darkness, and the gloom of affliction, and they will be driven into thick darkness. What a great picture, right? So good. So this is what, what God spoke to Isaiah, and He didn't just speak it to him, he spoke it to him with great power. Let's see how they're all doing. You are getting there. You're, you're doing good. They are drawing for us great darkness. I know it looks colorful. Our black markers ran out in the first service, so we're, I'm just going to ask for your creativity. Um, and they are helping us understand this chaotic darkness. In fact, you guys have done exceptional. Um, you guys can take a break. And on the count of three, can we do one unanimous clap? Are you all ready? One, two, three. Good job, y'all. This is the utter darkness. How many of y'all feel like your life looks like that? Anybody, anybody have a, a snapshot of your life that looks like that? Maybe a portion of your life? Many of y'all would say that I've been there, done that. I've got the scars to prove it. I think it's so fascinating that, that Isaiah, the beginning of that section that we just read, verse 11, says that the Lord spoke these things to him with great power. Now, this is the same Isaiah who, in chapter 5 or 6, had that heaven encounter where the seraphim grabbed a coal from the altar and touched his lips and said, now you're, you've been cleansed of your sin, and, and he was, from that point forward, going to be a mouthpiece for God, and God says, who will we send? And Isaiah says, here I am, send me, that whole moment. Like, like that was an amazing moment that Isaiah had, and you would think that for the rest of his life, that would set him only towards God, Right? Well, even at the beginning of these verses, it says this, For this is what the Lord said to me with great power, to keep me from going the way of this people. I cannot stress it enough. I don't say this because I get paid better if I talk about the Bible. I'm saying that if you don't hold on to the Word, you are destined for darkness. It's, it's, it's a no-brainer. In, in, in conversation of our, our relationship with God or this whole faith journey, if you don't cling to the Word of God, darkness is your destination. And if you don't continuously seek God for a sign to keep you strong, you are also out there on your own strength and eventually you will come to the place of darkness. If that was so for the prophet Isaiah who had an encounter with angels, how much more so is it for us? The gift of a sign. If we're not asking God for a sign, what we're saying is, no, nah, I'm good. No, nah, I'm, I'm good. We're good. This is as much as I want us to be. Which is such a sad way to live life, a minimalist life. I just want to have a minimalist relationship with God. I want to, I want to have a toe in, but I don't want to have all, I don't want to be all in. And even Isaiah is saying, in order for me to be all in, I need God to speak to me with great power. 
And I'm just, I'm just sharing this with y'all so we, we can share our life with you. If, if I'm not in the Word regularly, I try my best to make it daily, not just because of my title, but because I love the mess out of Jesus. And when I'm not there in His presence, my family will tell you that I am different, not in a good way. And so I have to have Him speaking to me. Great power is kind of intimidating to me. I would prefer like kind and gracious. But occasionally, I need Him to speak to me with great power so that I don't go the way of this world. What? You, you couldn't do that. Yeah, I could. As one of my favorite comedians once said, we're all one decision away from stupid. <laughs> we all have the capacity for idiocity. I don't even know if that's a word. And so I, I have to. We have to. If you've been in a relationship with Christ for a day, you know that you need Him all the time. This is what the Lord said to me with great power to keep me from going the way of this people. He says, don't call everything an alliance these people say is an alliance. Remember that whole narrative with Ahaz and all of those different kings trying to gather together and let's, let's be buddies and let's do this together. He's saying, don't, don't, just because your society and your culture is saying these things are, are a good thing, don't buy into it. He goes on and he says this, don't fear what they fear. Do you know how often in my life I feel childish because I don't freak out over the same things that other people freak out about? And it's not because I don't care about what other people are going through. It's just because I'm not, this is not an elevation, okay? It's just, if anything, it's me showing how simple-minded I am. But there might be some in here who are employers and, and gas prices affect your business. Minimum wage affects your business. Health care affects your business. Taxes. Oh, did he just say that? There are very real things that have implications and ramifications on the business. Let me ask you a question, though. When we get to heaven, will your business exist? Will taxes exist? Then why do we fear what the world fears? And that doesn't mean that I've become numb to everything and nothing has purpose or value. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying there's no need to fear the things that are temporary. And so he says, don't fear as they fear. In fact, you are to regard only the Lord of hosts as holy and only, only, only He is to be feared. How, how difficult is that one for us to live out? I think there are some people that are more afraid of the dark than they are afraid of God. They're more afraid of taxes than they are of God. They're more afraid of run down the list. They have more fear for the things that are temporary than they do the thing, the one that is eternal. Only fear Him. If we did an assessment, how, this is one of those things where I'm like, okay, if, if technology continues to advance um, somewhere down the way, what if we had meters that were visible to everybody, right, that assessed all the different layers of life, and people could read your meter on how much you fear the Lord. <laughs> I wouldn't leave my house. I don't, I don't want you to see where I'm at today. Only fear the Lord. He should be held, only He should be held in all. He will be a sanctuary. 
Before the two houses of Israel, he will be a stone to stumble over and a rock to trip over and a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many are going to stumble over these and they will fall and be broken. They will be snared and captured. And this is what he says. This is what God's saying to him to, to excel through this season. He says, bind up the testimony. What is the testimony? The testimony is the truth of who God is. Bind up the testimony. Bind up the truth of who God is. Bind it up. Seal up the instructions among my disciples. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. I will wait for him. The response during these days that we're going to get to shortly to, to make it through in strength and power and resolve is all centered on the Word. And if we are careless to hold on to the Word, if we are careless with the Word in our heart, we're going to arrive at some very dark places. He goes on, he says, Here I am with the children that the Lord has given me to be signs and wonders in Israel for the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. Let's jump down to verse 21. Well, 20 says this, the law and the testimony, to, to the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to those, if they don't speak according to this word, there will be no dawn for them. They will wander through the land dejected and hungry. When they are famished, they will become enraged and looking upward will curse their king and their God. They will look toward the earth and see only distress, darkness, and the gloom of affliction, and they will be driven into thick darkness. What an what a upper. But we, we arrive there only when we don't hold on to the Word. What that tells me, and if you've lived enough years, you understand that dark days are going to happen. I've never met somebody at the end of their life, like in 80s, 90s, 100, and sat with somebody who never had a dark day. There are guaranteed going to be dark days. Now here's the fascinating thing about utter darkness. In this narrative, their unwillingness and the fact that they were not disciplined to hold on to the Word in them that way of living led them to utter darkness. The confusing thing that we spend a lifetime trying to understand is when, when it's God who brings us to the utter darkness. How do you distinguish between the two? Well, one, you're sinning, and the other one, you're being brought there. But you think about Abram, if we go back to there, because we've been all around all these guys, Abraham, Moses, David, we've been talking all around them for the last three weeks. When God first showed up to Abram, he fell asleep. Abram fell asleep, and a dreadful darkness fell over him. At that moment, that's when God spoke this profound promise to him. Listen, there's going to be nations that come from you and flow through you, and your people are going to be slaves for 400 years, and they are going to be oppressed for a long time. It was in that moment of utter darkness that God spoke to Abram, eliminating all of his faculties just so that he could get a hold of his heart and his mind to say, these things are going to happen, and I need to have your full attention. You know what's crazy? I don't pray that God would bring me to those places. God, would you please bring me to a place of complete darkness so that I am completely paralyzed only to hear your voice? How different would our life be if we said, God, paralyze me to the point where my only option is to hear you? Now, I, I think I got this right, but Grandma, Grandma Jo um, had, had some, some back um, challenges and whatnot, and I believe that one of the therapies was to sit in this container of body temperature water. Am I saying this right? Yeah, it's something therapy. I just know that there's this. And so the, if it wasn't water, it was, did you say air? 
Okay. I said water the first service. I don't even know what I was thinking, but, but it regulates it to your body temperature. Is that correct? Anyways, th- there's some type of a therapy where, where the air or the water is regulated to your body temperature. And if it wasn't Grandma Joe, it was somebody else I was talking to about this, that they realized after they sat there for a long time that all they felt were their thoughts. Because, you know, when you move around with something that's your own body temperature, you don't realize that your body's there. And so all you have, all you're aware of, are your thoughts. And it's completely dark. Now, that might sound relaxing to some people, but I think I'd be terrified. Not because of what I, was, what I would think, it's just I don't like the dark. But what if we were brought to such a place where all we were aware of is what God was speaking to our heart and our mind? I wonder if we would live our life. If, if, we, if, if, if God had promises and words to speak over us that were equally as paramount as Abraham, I wonder how differently we would pursue him. I wonder if we would actually pray, Father, bring me to a place of such desperation that I hear your voice. Because listen, my family situation, my unforgiveness situation, my financial situation is, is before you. You know what's going on, but I need to hear a word from you so that I have hope. That kind of hope does not come accidentally. So you can't dare point a finger at God that he's not speaking to you when you aren't putting yourself in a place to hear him. So stop fussing, stop gesturing to him as if he's not speaking. Because he created each one of us, wonderfully and fearfully made are all of us, and he treats us the same. No partiality. The only thing that's different is the pursuit on our part. You ever been around? You, you, I've talked about this before. You've been around somebody that's really like crazy pursuing Christ? They're a delight to be around because they've been in the presence of God. And there's joy and peace and compassion that just pours out of them. And then you've been around people that aren't pursuing God. And the narrative of their life is strikingly different. They may not be hateful, but if they're not hateful, they are very gray, lifeless, passionless. Those who don't hold on to the Word will look up and curse, and they will look down at the earth and see only distress, darkness, the gloom of affliction, and they will be driven into thick darkness. Man, what a life-giving message this morning. There is our canvas that brings us to chapter 9, where we read the word, nevertheless. The reason why this nevertheless is so profound is because the darkness that they had been driven to was they, they were brought there on their own accord, their own disbelief, their own lack of pursuit, lack of heart. Um, that's what brought them there nevertheless. That is phenomenal news to 100% of everybody on the main floor and all y'all up there in the balcony. It's phenomenal news that we get to read nevertheless. Because whether it's God bringing us to a place of darkness where He wants to speak to us, or whether it's our own unwillingness to pursue Him or our own sin, nevertheless, that's phenomenal news. Nevertheless, the gloom of the distressed land will not be like that of former times when He humbled the land of Zebulun. We're not going to get into all of that. He's just saying there was a day in our past that was really, really dark. Well, it's not going to be as dark as that. It's still going to be dark, but it's not going to be that dark. But in the future, 
He will bring honor to the way of the sea, to the land east of the Jordan, and to Galilee of the nations. Now, I want to pick that apart because we could just read that over and just be like, oh, okay, that's interesting verbiage. Nowhere else in the Bible is the phrase way of the sea ever mentioned. And, and so we're not going to land on that. It's just interesting that Isaiah speaks that, that he will bring honor to the way of the sea, to the land east of the Jordan, and to Galilee of the nations. Do you know the region that he's kind of alluding to right here is exactly where Jesus lived? That's how honor is going to be brought to those places. Now, some of y'all's translations might read this way. Um, to the land east of the Jordan, and to Galilee of the Gentiles. Why is that significant? Because even before there was a great commission, God speaks through Isaiah, the great commission right here. That this message of hope is not just hemmed in for the children of Israel, but God is a God of the nations. God has a heart for all people. And so where does he initiate that? Where does he initiate this plan? No other place other than Galilee of the Gentiles where he sends his son, Emmanuel, God with us. God's heart for the nations is that he would be with his people. How profound is that? That we have the Great Commission right there. His heart for all people is where he's going to, he's going to bring honor not only that, but he's bringing honor where for generations now there's been nothing but dishonor. That same region where the, 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 the purification bowl was taken off of its stand and set on common ground. The, the canopy for the Sabbath was removed. All, all of those different ways to dishonor him, he's going to, in fact, respond in a way of honor by sending his own son. Not just for the children of Israel, but for the nations. The people walking in darkness have seen what? That was really compelling. They've seen a great light. Now, I'm going to do my best here. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. And that is my metaphorical light bulb, okay? Let me give some radiance to it. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Well, what's the result of the great light? A light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness. You have enlarged the nation and increased its joy. The people have rejoiced before you as they rejoice at harvest time and as they rejoice when dividing the spoils after a war. For you have shattered their oppressive yoke and the rod on their shoulders, the staff of their oppressor, just as you did on the day of Midian. Now that may not sound like a whole lot of anything to you, but we're going to unpack this just to get an idea of what Isaiah is speaking. Yes, for the people of his time, right then and there, but then these words will echo for all of the, the history of humanity and the future for humanity. And there's some profound things that happen when this light that is not determined on our, on our excellence, this light has come. And how, how crazy is this that we didn't, the children of Israel didn't worship hard enough and then the light came. Or they didn't turn their hearts and then the light came. The light chose before creation to come. That's called sovereignty. God's sovereign plan planned in advance for there to be a light to come. So that back then in the Old Testament as people are living in the land of darkness, a light came. Right now, in these days, if you find yourself living in dark territory, the light is coming. 
We don't know the light unless we know darkness. And that's not an invitation to go get involved with a whole bunch of shenanigans that's going to get you in trouble because there's plenty of other things that are going to go on in life, whether it's death or, or hurt or pain or all these other kinds of things that we incur throughout life. There's all kinds of other pathways to darkness, but we don't know light until we've tasted darkness. And it's in that moment, and it's such a beautiful moment where, whoa, I'm going to fall over. All right, this right here is the nation of Israel. And what he's saying here in these verses is this. You have, after this great light and this light has dawned, you have enlarged the nation. You've enlarged the nation. Looks kind of small right now, but he is going to expand the parameters. I know this looks like an eyeball now, but I'm going to expand your territory so that within the, the realm of that territory that is newly established, you can experience joy. His light in our life is purposeful. He doesn't do it just to show off. Though he's showing off, he's not looking for compliments. He's just wanting to show off His goodness to us. Our challenge in our flesh and bones here is to take full advantage of that enlarged territory that He accomplishes in our life. I think that we're awkward with it. We can be awkward with God's freedom that He brings to our life. We still feel like we need to live like a slave because we feel like we're more deserving of that rather than we are deserving of freedom. And whether we deserve it or not is not the topic of conversation. What we need to look at is the fact that He has in fact become light for us and that light helps us see what He's doing, and we need to live within the scope of the light that is shining. I don't think I can repeat that. And what we wrestle with for the duration of our life is like just trying to get comfortable in the light. Trying to get comfortable living in His presence, living in His joy. I want to tell some people today, I want to tell some people right now, there are some people in here who feel guilty for laughing and smiling and having a good time. Because you are currently in the throes of pain, maybe you're in the throes of loss, and it feels guilt, you feel guilty for smiling or laughing or having joy. I understand that that sorrow lasts through the night, but joy comes in the morning. There are too many people living in the land of night and they're not letting the morning come with new joy. I understand there's a time for everything. There's a time for all of those things. It's meant to be a time, not a destination. We're supposed to live in the land of joy. And we get the fullest picture of it when we have navigated through darkness, holding on to His Word, trusting that one day His light's going to shine on our life. And then when it does, here's why, we, here's why there's joy. Because we finally realize that He has never left us not one time. We think that we're walking through darkness like this, like I'm the only one here, I don't hear anything, I don't hear God, I don't, I don't, hear, I don't feel friendships anywhere, I, just, I feel lost. And then when the light turns on and we choose to see the light, we see that God has been with us all the time. And in that same moment where we want to burst out in laughter, it's also full of tearful moments of like, oh my gosh! He has not left me. What was I freaking out about? His presence was not determined by my awareness of Him. 
God, you're so good. He wants us to live in this land. Maybe for all of y'all in the back, you may not be able to see this. He wants us to live in the land of joy. He wants us to get comfortable living in the land of joy. He doesn't want us to live in the land of darkness. This light reveals. Watch this. You have enlarged the nation. You have enlarged the nation and increased its joy. Listen to this, please. Where the light of Christ exists, there's growth. Y'all, I, I just love God's navigating and weaving all of this. Ephesians 4.15, but speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into Him. Let us grow in every way into Christ. Jesus enlarges our capacity to live in joy. And this enlarged territory that's accomplished by Him will never be too small or too big to hold His joy. It's a custom fit. However large that territory gets, that's how great His joy is. So we don't have to worry about joy running out. It's custom fit to the territory that He defines. He goes on, he says this, the people have, listen to how many times he says this, this different derivative or uh, a different version of joy. Increase its joy. The people have rejoiced before you as they rejoice at harvest time and as they rejoice when dividing the spoils. Here's what's so key to this. It's not just random happiness. That's called crazy. But the joy and the rejoicing, listen to the technicality here. The people have rejoiced before you. This is a purposeful joy. Because the joy goes back to Him. Because it's from Him. And so we're not just random happy people. We are intentionally joyful because we see where He's been involved in every aspect of our life. And I have to say this. If you profess to be a Christian, if you profess to know Jesus and you're a jerk, stop professing Jesus' name. I mean it with all conviction. If you have no capacity to have compassion and kindness and especially joy and you say you know Jesus, stop saying that you know Jesus because you don't. You don't know His love. You don't know His joy. If you can't be joyful, you don't know Him. And I, hope, I know that might seem like a dagger, but man, it's so confusing to the world when they have people saying, I, yeah, I know Jesus, but throw in all kinds of explicitives. It makes no sense to the rest of the world. Was that too harsh? I just realized, man, I, like, that's That's strong. Subpoint A to that. <laughs> Please, if you know Jesus, don't let anything or anyone keep you from being joyful. The world needs more joy. The world needs more Jesus, but they need to see Jesus through joyful people. Not people saying, do you know Jesus? I'm a jerk. <laughs> you have shattered the, the joy. Here's the context for the joy. You remember all of that from, from Abraham to Moses to David, all, all these guys. The common word was 
you guys are going to be oppressed. I feel like this morning, some people in here have grabbed a hold of that word that I've only said a couple times. You've held on to the word oppressed more than you've held on to light. But I want to tell you this morning just what he has done to the oppressors. And by the way, if you need some help on what the oppressor is, oppressors press, they drive, they drive and push, they are tyrants. Um, It means to be hard-pressed or to be a taskmaster. This is what Jesus has done to the taskmasters. You have shattered the oppressive yoke. I'm going to try to do this the best I can. I know y'all probably may not be able to see this super, super well, but this is a yoke. And the interesting thing about the yoke is that the reason why it's tiring to be in an oppressive yoke is because there's a profound strength that comes from those who are taskmasters. Does that make sense? Like, do you feel driven by anybody? Do you feel like, I mean, young people, I'm not talking about your mom at home. Your mom's not a taskmaster. It's just called responsibility. (laughs) But did you know that unforgiveness is a taskmaster? Because you are driven to live miserably. And so here is our metaphorical yoke. It kind of looks like owl eyes or glasses. I get it. And I'm going to put the letter O for oppress. And here's a P for people. The reason why the yoke is so miserable is because you are in it with oppression. And, and the way it works, I, I, I have very little knowledge on this, okay, but when you have two animals that are yoked together, you have one that is more strong and experienced with the lesser strong and lesser experienced one so that it's training the weaker one. Oppression, if you don't allow Jesus to crush it, it will act like the larger, more experienced of the two of you. And it will lead you through life. So if you chronically feel pressed or driven or enslaved, that's called oppression and you have been yoked with it by choice. It's your choice because there's a light that's come that has crushed the yoke. And so the only reason that you are living in that yoke is because it's your choice. Which is why it's so profound later on in life when Jesus would say, any of you tired and weary, come to me and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. My burden is light. Why is it light? Because this changes from a P to a J. And so when we are yoked with Jesus, He's carrying the burden. He's carrying the weight. That's why it's light and easy and restful. He says, be yoked with me. For far too long, you have deliberately been choosing to be yoked with oppression. You've been yoked with unforgiveness. You've been yoked with the pain of death. You've been yoked with the frustration of finances. Call it out. Name it what it is. But you've been yoked to that more than you've been yoked to me. And God would say, listen, I, I've, I've gone all, to all layers, all realms for you. I sent my best for you, my one and only, not only for you, but to you. And that light that is seen in my son has shattered this right here, has shattered this work. And so this new yoke that you take on, you're yoked with my son who brings you life and life abundantly joy and peace and compassion and kindness and goodness. Who wouldn't want to be yoked to that? 
It kind of sounds like some people prefer misery than they do Jesus. Once again, that's insanity. If you choose to be tied up with anything other than Jesus, you're crazy. You, you prefer misery. Now, what's the whole thing with Midian? I got like three and a half minutes. Here's the skinny on Midian. This is out of Judges chapter 6, and there's a guy named Gideon. This is what Gideon says of himself in the presence of, of God. Actually, it says the angel of the Lord came to him. The Midianites were like, I guess they just really were good at making children because they just covered the land, okay? They just made babies, and they just filled the earth, okay? And so because of their sheer size, they were terrorizing these nations. And then they wouldn't fight them. They would just, whenever, some, whenever a, a community planted crops, they would just go through and destroy the land. That's all, like, that's all they did. They weren't warriors, which is kind of lame, right? They just, just their sheer size forced other people out. But it was, other people were so captivated by their size that Gideon is, is in, the th- um, in the wine press threshing grain. Now, grain is not supposed to go in the wine house. Wine's supposed to be in the wine house. But he's in the wine house because he's afraid of the Midianites. Jesus, well, the angel of the Lord shows up and says, I'm going to use you to deliver my people. And this is what Gideon says of himself. Um, You realize that you have come to the weakest family represented in Israel and the weakest household of the weakest tribe, and I'm the youngest of the family. I think you're wrong. And the angel of the Lord's response was, but I'm with you. <sighs> Never mind you have no muscles and no training on fighting and that your family is the weakest. I'm with you. Now, as the narrative goes, Gideon starts gaining momentum and starts to gaining some followers, some warriors, so much that he had thousands of warriors following him. And at the paramount part of the story, where they're getting ready to attack the Midianites, this is what God says to him: listen, your army's too large. Because if you guys win right now, you'll think that you did it. And so he whittled it down twice, and he went from tens of thousands to 300. And here's the funny thing about when it got down to just the 300. The first battle, not even, I don't even, the way I read it, not even a sword was drawn from the 300. God so confused the Midianites that they pulled out their swords against each other and they killed each other. And so God's saying, I'm doing this through the least expected group, the least expected person. What does that sound like? It kind of sounds like, can anything good come of Galilee? Can anything good come of Nazareth? This baby that was born of a virgin fragile and needing 24-7 care just like all babies do, seems like an unlikely Savior. And yet, from the most or the least valuable part of the land, and from some, I mean, they, yes, they're part of the line of David, but nobody really knows them, comes this light, comes this sign comes this Savior, comes this Messiah in the form of a baby who lives for 33 some odd change of years. And in that small window of a time, accomplishes the most profound truth and, and I don't know what to call it other than provisions, makes the most amazing provisions within that time frame for all of humanity. Sounds like a far fetch, doesn't it? But it happened. And our responsibility 
And what we are called to do is no different than where we started when Isaiah is saying, if you don't hold on to the Word, you're going to live in the land of darkness. So we hold on to the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was, was with God in the beginning. That's Jesus. So we hold on to the Word. We live in the reality of His light. And we go and we live in a land of darkness. Now, this is, again, a metaphor. Let's say that this, actually, let's not even use this. Let's say from wall to wall, I had a string from wall to wall. In fact, let, let me do this. Can you all use your imagination with me? Let's go to, um, let's go to Cracker Barrel. I, don't, I just know that place because I love eating there. So let's go to, from Cracker Barrel all the way to um, Romps in Vermilion. If you haven't been there, you need to go eat some ice cream at Romps whenever it's open. Okay. Cracker Barrel to Romps. If I were to take a marker to draw out the span of our life, I'm talking like 90 years, 100 years, okay? Like a good life, 100 years. It would look like this thick. So for our lifetime, that little hash mark right there, our one job is to hold on to the Word and live in a land that it has perpetual darkness, but we've got perpetual light. We've got to hold on to the Word and live in the light. Hold on to the Word and live in the light. And smile while doing it. Be filled with joy. That's, that's crazy. I mean, that might be a, a stretch. It might be more narrow than that. But that is our lifetime, y'all. These light and momentary troubles pale in comparison to the exceeding, I think it's exceeding glory that is yet to come. I want to read these lyrics to you. If you haven't been doing this yet, you need to go listen to Lauren Daigle's album, Look Up Child. This song might sound familiar to some of y'all, especially if you've been in church for a long time. But the lyrics go something like this. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Here's some of the uh, verses. O oh soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see? There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Through death into life everlasting, He passed and we follow Him there. Over us, sin no more has dominion, for more than conquerors are we. His word shall not fail you. His word shall not fail you. He promised, believe Him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying His perfect salvation to tell. Can I get an amen somewhere in there? Hold on to His Word. Live in His light. Smile. And go walk in a dark world. That is the substance of our life. But if we are not in the Word, we are not in the light. When you're not in the light, we have no capacity for true joy. Only misery. And when you are living in darkness, darkness can't be light to darkness. Only light can be light to darkness. Amen? Now in that last section that we read through in Isaiah... You've shattered the oppressive yoke, and the, you've shattered the rod on their shoulders. You've shattered the staff of their oppressor. 
just as you did in the day of Midian? Victory. Great light, variegated victory. Victory on all layers of life. Marriage, children, business, relationships, the areas of unforgiveness. Craft a laundry list, if you will. His light accomplishes variegated victory. Right now, grab the connection card. We do this. If you're new to the church, we do this every Sunday morning where we present a question, and that's just so that you don't listen to a long-winded preacher and be like, okay, that's just sweet, cool. It's, it's paramount that you write some things down and respond. Here's the question. Where do you need victory? Be crazy intentional about this one. This is no small thing. You need to understand that as you write this down, the victory has already been accomplished. 